Appearances can be deceiving. Or another way to say that is you can't judge a book by its cover. We've been looking at the faith stories mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 over the course of the last number of weeks. And uh, during the last two weeks, we have been looking at stories of Samuel's life. And in the story today, we're going to see the contrast between what human beings often value over what the Lord values. Our ability to know the true nature of something is limited by our senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch, our intuition, and such things. And these things can mislead us, can't they? The Lord, though, on the other hand, he sees the true nature of everyone and everything. The Lord tells Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, says, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's trendy for businesses and people in places of leadership to claim to be transparent and to offer full disclosure. We hear these terms all of the time. They say these things about themselves and about their business practices, and it's a nice idea in theory, but the reality is usually far from the claims being made of full disclosure and transparency. To God, though, we are fully transparent, fully disclosed, whether we want to be or not. Do you remember those transparent models of the human body from back in grade school days where where you could see through the transparent skin to the muscles and the internal organs and the skeleton? Well, in a sense, that's how we appear to the Lord. He sees right through the surface layers to all of the stuff underneath, all of the stuff that we're trying so hard to hide from everyone else, and also all of the stuff that we wish others really did know about us, but we don't know how to show them that stuff. The Lord sees and he knows everything about us, the bad and the good, the ugly and the beautiful, all of it. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Well, just by quick review, Samuel was one of the greatest leaders that Israel ever had. And we noted that Samuel was firstly a spiritual leader for the people rather than a military tactician or a meticulous organizer or a brave warrior or one one possessing supernatural strength. These are all good abilities to have, and Samuel had some of them. But Samuel's primary concern and the focus of his leadership was leading the people into a relationship with the Lord. There were three things that we noted last time about Samuel that made him such an effective leader. First, he lived what he preached. The scripture verse that comes to mind when thinking about Samuel's life in this regard is 1 Timothy 4.12, where it says, Don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Second, his life was characterized by prayer. Something that stands out in Samuel's story again and again is how often he's seen praying. He was in a continual conversation with the Lord about the stuff in his life and the stuff in the lives of the people that he led. And then finally, he was humble, constantly directing people's attention to God rather than himself. Many people spend their life building a monument to themselves so others will remember them. Samuel spent his life directing people's attention to the Lord instead of to himself. Well, today we're going to look at the latter years of Samuel's life and begin to transition into David's story. So if you flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 8, that's where we'll be today. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Beginning in the first verse, it says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. 
and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So Samuel's intention was to pass the leadership of Israel to his two sons. But there's a serious problem with his plan. His sons are not like him. Samuel's sons didn't follow his ways, it tells us here. They didn't love the Lord like Samuel did. They didn't have the integrity that Samuel did. They were not honest. They were greedy. They accepted bribes. They corrupted justice. Now, we've been down this road before, haven't we? This sounds a lot like the situation with the old priest Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, the ones that Samuel grew up with. How did Samuel let this happen? Having grown up in the household of Eli, witnessing Eli's failures as a father, seeing the kind of wicked people that Eli's sons were, we would expect Samuel to have made a determined effort to not repeat Eli's story with his own two sons. There's no question that Samuel was an outstanding leader for Israel, a very godly person who loved the Lord. But for some unfortunate reason, these qualities didn't get carried into the lives of his sons. Why? How can a person like Samuel have sons like this? Well, if you have been a parent long enough to watch your children grow into adulthood, then you know there are no easy answers, and you probably are not asking this question. We can do our best to lay a foundation for our children, but when they get older, they will make their own choices about things and sometimes make choices directly opposite of what we would want for them. I believe Samuel probably did the best that he could to raise his sons, to love the Lord and to follow his ways. And there's no doubt that what they're doing is breaking his heart. Now, some people will quote the familiar proverb to us, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And that's a great proverb. But it's important for us to remember that it is a proverb of wisdom, not a promise. As a parent, we want to do all that we can to train up our children in the way they should go. Starting children off on the right path, pointing them in the right direction, teaching them the word of God and to model for them a life lived in obedience to that word and fellowship with the Lord. This proverb does not guarantee that our children will grow up to be what we want them to be, though. We're not machines. Our children are not machines. We're not writing software. We're raising human beings. They're going to make their own choices about things. We're being dishonest, and we're creating unreasonable expectations if we teach that this proverb is a promise. There are many parents who face the heartbreaking reality of a child who turns away from everything the parents taught them, even going so far as to reject faith in Christ. Did these parents fail in some way as parents? That's not a fair question. It's not a fair and reasonable conclusion to come to. We can't force our children to become the adults that we want them to be. We have seen children who make, who, we, we, we've seen children who were raised in wonderful homes make some of the most awful life choices imaginable. We all have. We also see children who were raised in the most awful situations grow up and make some of the most amazingly good life choices. Think about Samuel himself as an example, who grew up in that awful household of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. Things don't always work out the way we want them to with our kids. But if we will follow the wisdom of Proverbs 22.6, 
we stand a much better chance of seeing our kids grow up and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's not a guarantee that our kids will love Jesus and follow him with their life. But if we will train them up in the way they should go, we will have a tremendous, important contribution having been made toward that end in their life. Quick word to some of you parents. I want to encourage you to not give up hope for your wayward child. It isn't over yet. I've seen many children eventually return to those central truths that their parents raised them with. The enemy wants you to believe that your child has been forever lost, but that isn't true. The Lord loves your child, and he's not given up on your child. He's continuing to pursue and woo your child to himself. Keep praying, Dad and Mom, for your children. The Lord hears your prayers. He loves your children more than you do. He wants the best for your children more than you do. Trust him. Getting back to the story in verse 4. It says, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You're old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. So the people of Israel, they have great respect for Samuel as their leader, but they don't feel the same way about his sons, and understandably so. So they come to him expressing their concerns about the future of Israel when Samuel will no longer be able to lead them. And they propose that Israel have a king like all of the other nations. They want Samuel to establish a monarchy form of government for them like all of the other nations around them have. This is an interesting phrase, like all the other nations have. It's going to come up again in this discussion they're having with Samuel. And it reveals a lot about where they are getting their ideas for how to build their society and their culture. Rather than looking to the Lord and his word for their standards to build their culture, they're comparing themselves to the other peoples around them and getting their ideas from them. Well, it brings up a question for us, doesn't it? Where are you and I getting our ideas about how to build our life? Are we getting them from the Word of God or from all the others around us? We want to be like all of the other nations. It says, what a powerful draw that has on us to be like everyone else. You know, as much as we claim to be unique individuals, we look and act a whole lot more like sheep than the hardcore punk rock individualists that we like to think we are. We buy the same stuff everyone else buys. We eat the same foods. We watch the same TV. We see the same movies. We follow the same people on social media. We imitate the same trendsetters. We wear the same clothes, we adopt the same ways of thinking, and so forth. And this has been going on from the very beginning of human history. It's in our nature. It's baked into us. We are imitators. And we can't shut off the pool to be like others, but we can choose who it is that we're going to seek to be like. We want to be like Jesus Christ. We want to set him up as the standard that we try to measure up to and we imitate rather than popular public trends and opinions. Verse 6 says, But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. It says it displeased Samuel. He found the idea of appointing a king offensive. But rather than say a lot about it in the moment, he prayed to the Lord to learn what the mind of the Lord would be about this issue. And what a great example for us to follow. I mean, rather than me popping off, responding with my own first feelings and opinions on a matter of importance like this, I need to go to the Lord in prayer and seek his mind about it. 
And in verse 7 it says, And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So the Lord tells Samuel to, not to take this rejection personally. They're not rejecting him. They're rejecting the Lord as their king. As they've been doing since the Lord rescued them from slavery in Egypt, the Lord knows their hearts. Now granted, Samuel's sons taking over the leadership from their father was an issue, but that's just a pretext for what they're really wanting here. They want to be like all of the other nations with a human king as their leader. And the Lord tells Samuel to give them what they want, but warn them about what they're getting themselves into with a king. And so he does that in the next verses. We skip down to verse 19. And this is their response to the warnings that he gave them. It says, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. In spite of Samuel's very sober warnings that he gives them in verses 10 through 18, the people, they demand a king. And it's sad that they are demanding a king to do for them what the Lord has already been doing for them. The Lord led them out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. He has led them through all of the difficult times that they have faced. He has gone before them and fought their battles for them again and again. The Lord is the very best king they could possibly have. But they talk as if the Lord has done nothing for them up to this point in their lives. In reality, they would not even be in the land of Israel right now if it had not been for the Lord. They want to be like all the other nations. The other nations have a human being, a tangible, physical, human leader. The Israelites, on the other hand, have had an invisible God as their king who communicates with them through an intermediary who at this present time is Samuel. They live by faith in an invisible God. They are led by faith in an invisible God. They don't want to live by faith anymore. They didn't want to live the life their forefather Abraham is commended for anymore. They want a tangible king who they can believe will bring tangible benefits and security to their lives. Unfortunately, what they want and need can't be had through a human being, through a human king, their problem is not their king. Their problem is themselves. They don't need a new king. They need a new heart. And we often pin our problems on the wrong things too, don't we? We think if we had a different king, then our problems would go away. If we had a different job, a different wife, a different husband, a different school, different clothes, different house, more money, different church different president, then our problems would go away. But our problems reside right here, in us, rather than in these other things. It's a heart issue. And thankfully, that's the thing that Jesus Christ came to do, to give us new hearts. Well, directed by the Lord, Samuel, he set about the task of getting a king. For them. The person the Lord had Samuel select and anoint as king was exactly the kind of king that the people thought they wanted. He was this big, handsome, regal-looking guy who stood a whole head taller than anyone else in Israel. He was the most impressive-looking man in the whole country. His name was Saul. But sadly, Saul 
would not be the king that they need. He would turn out to be a reflection of the people rather than a true leader for the people. He looked the part of a king on the outside, but on the inside he was severely lacking. The Lord gave Saul everything he would need to be an effective and successful king, too. But Saul, he turned out to be a person without any kind of spiritual depth. He was a shallow person. He was a person who was more inclined to follow his own ideas rather than obey the Lord. He had no faith. He had no real appreciation for the things of God. He was just like the people he was trying to lead. And the final act that doomed Saul as king occurred in 1 Samuel 15. The Lord gave Saul very specific instructions to annihilate Israel's enemy, the Amalekites, for reasons that we don't have time to go into today. But rather than doing what the Lord told him to, Saul did what he thought would be best. And in the process, he violated some very important and sacred rules. And the Lord told Saul through the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, 22, he said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And from that day forward, the blessing of God was removed from Saul, and he began falling upon another who would replace Saul as king. The Lord had chosen another to take Saul's place, a man after God's own heart. And so let's flip over to 1 Samuel 16. The Lord sends Samuel to the town of Bethlehem. Yeah, that Bethlehem. to anoint one of the sons of a man named Jesse to be the next king of Israel. No one other than Samuel himself knows the purpose for his visit. But Samuel invites the elders of the town and Jesse and his sons to a special worship gathering and meal. And in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16, it says, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Oh, the danger of first impressions. Saul had been a beautiful physical specimen, the best Israel had to offer. He's described as standing a whole head taller than anyone else in Israel, but he ended up lacking what was really needed to be a king over God's people. Jesse's oldest son, Eliab is an impressive-looking person, too. Not only does Eliab look the part, but as the firstborn son, it would be expected that he is the chosen one. So Samuel, he felt certain this must be the one the Lord had sent him to anoint as the next king. But the Lord doesn't always do the expected. Verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We are often misled by what we see with our eyes. We can only see what's apparent from the outside. We make judgments about people based on what they look like, what they wear, where they live what they do for a living, where they are from, the color of their skin, how much education they have, where they got that education from, their accent, their height, their weight, their age. The list of categories we use to judge people is nearly endless. And how many of these categories that we use to judge people give us an accurate assessment of the person? Not very many. We're often quite wrong about people, aren't we? Based on our initial impressions and judgments. But the Lord looks at the heart of a person. The Lord's able to look past the exterior and see what's really on the inside. He sees who we really are. 
verse 8. It says, Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. Each of Jesse's seven sons who are present that day, they pass before Samuel, but none of them are the one the Lord had chosen. Samuel knows one of Jesse's sons is to be anointed king, but none of these are the ones. Something isn't right. Now remember, no one present other than Samuel himself knows what all of this is about. It's all very confusing to the rest of them. They're just like, what's, what's Samuel's problem? What's his issue? Verse 11, it says, So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We'll not sit down until he arrives. They're still the youngest. He's tending the sheep. Jesse hadn't even thought to bring his youngest son in for, from the pastures. He's the youngest, the least important of all his sons. Samuel, though, is relieved to hear that there is still one more son, even if it is the youngest. So verse 12, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. It says he's glowing with health and he had a fine appearance and handsome features. David is said to be handsome. But it's not his outward appearance that made him God's choice. It's his heart. Back in chapter 13, verse 14. The Lord said he was going to choose a man to replace Saul, a man after his own heart. And in verse 7 above, remember the Lord told Samuel that he looks at the heart rather than the things that people look at. Rise and anoint him. This is the one. Verse 13, it says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. No explanation is ever given to the people present, including David himself, of why Samuel anoints him with oil. All any of them know is that David is chosen over his brothers for some unknown purpose. And this mysterious event of this day will soon pass into the background of their memories. It says, from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David powerfully. Says, After the ceremony that day, David, he goes back to the same humble occupation that he had before, of tending his father's sheep, except for one important difference. The Holy Spirit has come upon him in a unique way, setting him apart for a special purpose and preparing him for what God has called him to do in the future, to be the next king of Israel. In closing, it will be many years before David actually assumes the throne as king. But the Lord will be preparing him for that day, even as David works as a shepherd in his father's pastures. In fact, David's days as a shepherd tending sheep will prove to be some of the most important preparation of his life. Many believe it was during this time of his life when David wrote that well-known psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, 
They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The first line of the psalm states the central truth. The Lord is my shepherd. And then the rest of the psalm explains what that means. How the Lord is his shepherd. How it affects his life. The benefits and blessings that come with the Lord being his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. This is the hard attitude and truth that set David apart from Saul. Saul. That made him so precious to the Lord and made the Lord so precious to him. The Lord is his shepherd. He sees himself that way. I'd like us to do that this week. Take that one idea the Lord is my shepherd. And think about that. Meditate on it. What it means for you and me personally. The Lord is my shepherd. It had a profound impact on David's life. And it can have a profound impact on our life too, can't it? The Lord is my shepherd. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your good word. We thank you for these stories about Samuel and about David and the other men and women of faith in the scripture. We thank you for the way you have worked in their lives, and we thank you for the way that you work in our lives, Lord. Father, we want to embrace this same truth that David did and, and allow it to inform and infuse our life. The Lord is my shepherd. Make that so in us, Lord, that you are our shepherd. May that truth become so precious and life-transforming for each of us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.